Okay, so you can turn to Psalm 32 and verse 8. Right? Psalm 32 and verse 8, where um, the Lord says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Okay, so the Lord is talking about uh, instructing, teaching, guiding, right? three different things. And um, I mean, so it's, it's greatly reassuring because. Um, um, okay, Prince is saying increase the volume a bit. Okay. Uh, um, now, Prince, is it better? Check two, three. Well, but you're getting the reverb now. Okay. I hope that's better. Okay, so Psalm 32. The Lord is saying, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. And uh, what is reassuring is that, um, you know, these are very, very um, confirming. And uh, it's like the Lord is saying, I will. I will instruct. I will teach. I will guide you. And and then uh, he says, um, uh, you, you, I will instruct you, teach you in, in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye, you know, which is... Uh, Again, um, I will guide you with my eye, uh, and then goes on to say in the next verse, do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Right. So like, you really, really have to force these animals in order to, for them to you know, come to you, and then you need to control them, etc. But uh, so the Lord is saying, don't be like that. And but I will teach, I will instruct, I will guide. And he's saying, I will guide you with my eye, which is uh, which is really um, a sign of intimacy, right? A closeness. That the Lord is saying, I will guide you with my eye. Okay. So we have the privilege today to be instructed, to be taught, to be guided by the Holy Spirit. And while we have the principles and precepts to to fall back on, to say, okay, this is the heart of God, this is the nature of God, but we have the privilege of being intimately led by Him, right? So saying, I will guide you with my eye, which means that, you know, one needs to observe the face of the person in order to be guided by the eye, right? In order to notice even those small gestures, um, and we have the privilege. We are, we don't not only have the privilege, but we are invited into that a kind of a relationship, right? So, um, so why don't we just pray and say, Lord, I we thank you for this kind of an intimate relationship that we have the privilege uh, of uh, walking in, but, but also that you are inviting us, inviting us to this. Right? It is, it is ours, right? So let's uh, let's pray, Father God. Uh, this morning we just want to thank you, Lord. We thank you for this, uh, for these "I will" statements, God, that you will instruct us, that you will teach us, that you will guide us, and and Lord, we thank you that it is not from a distance, uh, uh, Lord, from a place of, uh, Lord, just legalistic uh, kind of set of rules, Lord, but but a, a living, intimate, close relationship, oh God, that you are calling us to, and that you will even guide us with your eye. And we thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in each one of us as believers. And we thank you, it's, uh, Lord, it's something that you're inviting us to. And Lord, we pray today that it will be a, a step of uh, walking closer, Lord. It, it, today that it will be a step to understand your heart, Father God, and, um, and walk uh, in line with your word, God. We thank you. Uh, in Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, that really uh, today, you know, this this verse really came alive today because uh, as I was coming to the uh, to the Bible College today, and uh, I thought I won't make it because there was so much traffic from just crossing that ring road. I said, "Gone today is gone." I think I'll have to call and cancel the class, and then thank God for Google Map. <laughs> Your entire life gets rerouted, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so so. And this, I was just reminded over and over again, you know, the Lord saying, I will teach. And so I, I was able to reach here earlier than I would, if I would have taken that route, you know, take, taking all those shortcuts and all that. So so anyway, the Lord's teaching, guiding, instructing uh, is 
it's for our benefit it's for our advantage right and uh, and it, sometimes we go through some tough tough times tough seasons and and the lord is really you know uh, burning up certain things in us building strength in us refining us uh, so that we can be better yeah okay okay so where did we stop uh, last class um um okay so we were looking at uh, six practical rules for interpreting scripture right so uh, why is it important to believe correctly anyone why is why is it important to rightly divide the word word uh, in order to apply it in our lives yeah in order to apply it at least, like, maybe we can at least get the principle of it. Mm. And also, uh, if we interpret the scripture properly, uh, when we know the context, when we know when it's written uh, to the audience, we can just take the principles and then apply them. Mm. True. So, the, the rightly, rightly dividing the word is important for us to rightly believe, and uh, because our conviction leads to uh, our living. Right? decisions, choices, living, uh, the way we live our lives. And uh, uh, if we are going to believe that, you know, for example, on a road, if you're going to believe that every green light means stop and every red light means go, uh, if you're going to believe sincerely in our heart, now that's going to end up in chaos. Right? So, it's, it, so that's the thing. You know, it's dangerous uh, to, to, I mean, divide the word wrongly and apply it. You know, that's how heresies are born. That's how cults are born. That's how you know things happen. So, uh, so it's important. So that's why Paul uh, instructs Timothy, and he says, you know, rightly divide the word of God. Um, and he says, you know, you give yourself entirely to these things, to these teachings, that your progress may be evident to all. You know, there is going to be spiritual progress, and it's going to be tangible. It's going to be visible uh, to all. Right. So it's very important uh, for us to know that. So we said, uh, okay, this is these are some rules that we're going to use in order to interpret. Okay, interpret in the light of the context we said okay let me just uh, share the notes also um, okay okay so we said interpret in the context of the uh, passage and interpret in the light of progressive revelation and i think that's where um, yeah we had that question about uh, you know if uh, about polygamy and you know uh, so, see, one thing about progressive revelation is it's not that we are taking a U-turn, okay? So, what do we mean by that? When it comes to progressive revelation, it's not like God is saying at the beginning of the chapter, even as we, if you, okay, if you look at, okay, uh, like a book, okay? So, it's not like at the beginning of the chapter, God is saying, do this. And at the end of the chapter, God is saying, no, I changed my mind, don't do it. Right, so God's nature is holiness and righteousness. So, uh, and whatever He's saying is consistent. His word is consistent with His nature, His will, everything. So, when we say progressive revelation, it's it is something that is revealed to us progressively. Okay, so His nature is the same, His holiness is the same, His ways are the same, and uh, it is something that is progressively revealed to us. So pro that is why we call it progressive revelation, right? So when we see, okay, all these, um, you know, the, the Old Testament sacrifices and everything, it's, it was pointing to the cross. And uh, like, we don't know how many people actually got, you know, a, a proper revelation of that, even as they were doing it, but they knew that, okay, you know, this is something that we do. And then we know that blood sacrifice is going to, it, it, whether it's symbolic or not, but they 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 did it sincerely because that God had laid down that and it was pointing to something. But they said, "Okay, my sins are taken away when I do this." Okay, but I knew it, I need to do it again, right? Because it's for a season, it's for a uh, for a time, and so um, yeah, so we see that. But then it was pointing to the cross, and we know that after the cross, there is no more need for the. Uh, sacrifices, right, for those rituals, because Christ is the fulfillment of the law, right. So, so that is what we mean by 
progressive revelation and so ravali had a question okay you know so in the old testament you know all the men of faith had multiple spouses uh, multiple wives um, so you know how can how is that fair um, she didn't use the word how is that fair but she said you know how did why did god permit that and now we are saying you know there's only one one man so uh, you know right from uh so the, the I, i was just reading through some so I'll let me just share okay so so right from uh, the beginning we see that god's plan is adam and eve it's not adam eve sheila you know whatever it's, it's adam and eve so god's plan for marriage is man shall you know uh, so man shall leave is father and mother and cleave to his wife okay so we see that pattern there right um we see that principle and that plan god's plan right there so now um like one of the things that i uh, just read through an article and one of the things i saw was that see the bible uh, at places is uh, descriptive okay what do we mean by that this describes the situation right it says okay this is what happened this person committed adultery this is what happened this is where this person killed and so it's a very direct um it's at some place very very in the face right just says it at, as it is and sometimes we are shocked sometimes we are even repulsed by some things that are written there and say like, oh how can this happen right it's a very direct book so it's a very descriptive book right and certain texts are descriptive so that does not mean that because a, a certain situation or a circumstance is described that do, that does not mean that that is what is prescribed for our life prescription you know when it's something is prescribed it means you therefore you also do it right so it's not prescript it's not prescribing for us and right? saying okay this is what is des- described no, this is what happened this man you know did all this so does that mean you know i'm also um, a believer in god a worshipper of god so therefore i can also do it no right so you we go with the nature of god we go with the plan of god and then we go with uh, the truth of god's word and then we obey that so so certain places it is descriptive certain places we know there is a there is a prescription we are prescribed we are instructed to carry out so that's that's one thing to take note of when it comes to um you know this whole thing of uh polygamy right secondly um there's no you know there's no command from god to take multiple wives you know there's no command right? when you go through scripture um it could have been a cultural practice it could have been a practice you know for example uh in those times women uh did not have uh you know in terms of Uh, finances in terms of um, wealth etc you know it was uh, it was always controlled by the man right so they did not have access to it and if they lost a, a, a husband then you know uh, they they lost everything right so so it could have been a cultural practice so as a safeguard for women whatever you know so it could be a cultural practice but we see that god did not command a man to take on multiple you know women or multiple wives and so on and though and though we see that people did that i right? see abraham did that david did that solomon did that uh, uh, by the way not about solomon uh, how many wives and concubines yeah. 700 and 300 you know other women so it's like almost 1000 but we see that um, how many children did he have i think there are two yeah so you know solomon was um i don't know you know like somebody said you know he was really searching for intimacy you know he wanted to belong he wanted to feel loved somebody said somebody's opinion i'm just saying okay so he had all these relationships he thought that would maybe probably satisfy but he actually if you look at it he had two children right so that's something to take note just an aside okay anyway so these are these are things you know like uh, and also uh, okay we're just coming to the end of this um so when we see that um, then uh, because of the outcome of these 
multiple you know like polygamous kind of a relationship that people that men had there's no positive outcome of it if you see you know there's no positive outcome in fact uh, nathan comes and says warns david you know this is what you did murder adultery you took someone okay you you took someone and then you married them and all that married this person but then this is god's word for you you know what you did was wrong you know, we see that uh, even um, rachel leah uh, and uh, jacob's marriage uh, we read that you know it was as a result of you know laban's treachery but we also see that it led to a lot of strife between the sisters right one would one was barren the other one was and then they would always uh, st there was strife they would quarrel etc so it, the outcome of it was also not pleasant in any way right so so we see all that and um, yeah and then we um, we can we can conclude that it's not you know, it's it's uh, it's not God's plan. It's not God's purpose. Um, though, uh, and we see that God did not explicitly command, um, and certain cultural practice practices continued. And out of the revelation that people had, they came to a place and say, okay, you know, this is actually God's heart. This is actually God's plan, and this is God's. I mean, so when we come to the New Testament, when we come to the epistles, and all, we see that um, Paul writing and you know instructing, um, especially leaders in the church, you know. You be, uh, you know, you be like this, right? Um, so, so that's the thing. So, I hope that helps. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, we're just addressing one question here. Okay. Um. Yeah. Um. So. On, a, on an overall context like this particular polygamy might be one of the uh, topic but there are a couple of topics in the bible which uh, which are revealed progressively uh, when we coming to the new testament yes right uh, so for example when, for example salvation salvation mm. for example <clears throat> sacrifices mm. and uh, you know all of that um, i mean prophecy everything it's been uh, progressively revealed to us how it is today uh, so when we say the Bible at places is descriptive, but doesn't mean that uh, it is what it is prescribing for us. If somebody comes with a question saying that, even though I question myself, for example, okay, what is prescribed for me and what I should not be prescribed? Because always when we are looking at it, we are looking at the old, New Testament as a reference to the Old Testament back. Uh, because after christ what is i mean whatever god uh, christ has given us is something that we are following it as a standard right now uh, as a believers so before that there are a lot of practices which are which are not applicable for present age or not applicable for who who we are in christ so what what do we say that is prescribed for us i mean just my understanding is it like what jesus told us this is what it is like the new covenant that he made with us is prescribed for us and uh, if we had to go back to the old testament not the new covenant the old covenants and the old testament what it is prescribing for us so so one one one, one good <clears throat> i hope everybody got that question right so one good rule of thumb is the fact that see the moral laws of god don't change okay so the, the heart of god the nature of god that it does not change so that's one big reference point for us okay his nature his holiness everything doesn't change his moral laws don't change well the ritual laws change for a reason because of the change of covenant and the ministry the work of the holy spirit again you know with the change in dispensation of covenant change right so so that's for us something for us to take note of and uh, and go with that. And we see explicit instructions um, in the life of Jesus, in the teachings of the Lord, and in the epistles. Right? We see we see that. So, as New Testament believers, right, uh, we can we can learn from that. We can you know uh, order our lives according to that. But we also learn from the Old Testament saints. We also learn from you know from it's there for a reason and we know that 
both old and new uh, it's it's the word of god so so when we look at the old we look at it in the light of the cross you know that's one very important thing um okay this is leading up to the cross so i i remember that even when i when we study the characters in the bible we see that okay it's leading up to the cross some things the way they moved and the way you know the god dealt with them it would not directly apply to me here and now because we have the indwelling presence of the holy spirit we have the revelation we have the you know we are in a different dispensation so um, we understand that oh, and then we we apply accordingly right and the beautiful thing is we have the presence of the holy spirit uh, in us we have the community of believers who also present have the presence of the holy spirit in dwelling right and uh, the beautiful thing is that when it comes to you know um uh, a confirmation of word correction etc god does does that uh, individually and in the context of community so that's the beautiful thing right um where um, there is a there is a witness in our heart when somebody confirms what he has already put in us and that's a beautiful thing that we have today uh, as new testament believers yeah okay any other questions before we move um okay okay so um online uh students anything that you want to add or ask if not we can move um okay so let's um let's look at the next one okay so we interpret scripture in harmony with other scripture i think that um that's uh, kind of self explanatory in the sense that you know um if you look at one part of scripture we said you know we looked at the context of the verse uh, context of the text and that gives us a greater understanding why it is there so in seemingly you know certain places where it seems to contradict uh, or you know uh, seemingly contradict we know that well the heart of god we know that god is holy he never changes um yesterday today and tomorrow you know forever he's the same and uh, and so we 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 compare with other scriptures you know in harmony with other scriptures so i don't just take a verse out of context or i don't take a, you know certain instruction but i compare it with other portions of scripture and see you know what does it um, uh, what what does it say okay so and and then uh, uh, interpret it right okay so the next one is uh, interpret interpreting what is unclear okay in the light of what is clear okay so okay let, let's take uh, for example uh, you know this uh, this example which is um, uh, 1 corinthians 15 29 okay um i think uh, are you studying corinthians this semester or next uh, next okay by i think that's the third year fine yeah okay so um so 1 corinthians 15 29 it says um paul makes this statement okay or this question um what will they do who are baptized for the dead you know in in 1 corinthians 15 he's talking about resurrection from the dead he's talking about the reality that uh, uh, the fact that re resurrection is a reality Okay, because there was some teaching going around that it won't happen and, and etc. So he's actually teaching them, you know, if we don't, if the dead do not rise, our faith is in fact, you know, it's empty, you know, and so he's teaching that. So then he he's referring to, uh, I mean, he so th this particular just consider this question, you know, he says, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? why then are they baptized for the dead so he's referring to uh, something that was happening there at that time so there were there was some baptism happening we know what baptism is for it's a proclamation of faith right of it's <clears throat> symbolic of what has already happened to us on the inside so here during paul's time in corinth there was this practice of baptism happening for the sake of the dead okay so mr x is already dead so here is mr y who's taking baptism for the sake of mr x okay so some kind of uh, you know so so then we look at this text and then we see okay 
So is that okay? Right? It seems to be a little un unclear, especially in today's time. You know, it seems to be unclear. You know, why should this happen? Do you think that can happen? So we know a whole lot of teaching came out of that, saying that you can do something, you can pray something, you can do something here for the sake of people who are already dead. And then this whole teaching of from, you know, let's say they did not accept the Lord or they lived a life that was questionable when they were on the earth. And now that they are dead, you know, maybe they are in a place where it's neither heaven nor, you know, neither the presence of God nor is it really hell. But they are in a place where a midsection, where based on what I do here on earth, they could either be promoted or demoted, you know. In, a, in other words, purgatory. Right? So based on what we do, it's something they get, uh, they are advanced to heaven. Or, so the whole thing of salvation by works, another version of it. Right? Salvation for the dead by works, etc. So we know it is wrong. So here, Paul is actually talk, referring to a particular practice which was there, due, prevalent during that time. He is not affirming that practice. He is just making a point saying, hey, you know, if you're saying resurrection is not there, then why are you even, you know, I see these people doing this for the sake of the dead. They are doing, which means they have a some kind of belief that the dead will come back to life at some point. right? And for them, for their benefit, you know, this kind of thing is happening. right? So what is he referring to? He's referring to people's belief that, yes, there is an afterlife and there is resurrection from the dead. So that is what he is addressing here. Okay, so... Um, so when we when we when we come come across certain uh, scriptures like that, okay. So we don't build a doctrine on that, right? We don't build doctrine on what is uh, unclear, okay. Um, so you know, teachings about indulgences, etc., also came because of money. Um, like we see in, uh -huh. in Luke sixteen nine, where it says, uh, "Make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon, that when you fall, they may receive you into an everlasting home." and uh, you know, used by the church for the practice of indulgences. Uh, we know what indulgences is, right? Like uh, the church used certain, they had some kind of licenses. Uh, uh, you know, you pay so much so that you can, you, it, it kind of the priest would give you a license or a permission to sin. Okay, so so these kind of practices, wrong practices came. So if there is an unclear passage, don't build a doctrine on it. Um, you know, so look, look at what is clear, what is stated clearly and interpret this unclear based on what is very clear. So if you look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 29, okay, it seems like hey, we can actually, what is this baptism for the dead? You know, So instead of building a doctrine on, yes, uh, we can do something for the dead, look at what is clear, what is stated. What is stated is that, yeah, one dies, one lives, one dies, and their destiny is uh, decided based on what they did when they were alive, not when they are. Okay, so he who believes in Jesus and confesses him is born again, and that is salvation. So, so in the based on, uh, based on that, when we look at the scripture, then we see, realize that okay, he's actually referring to a wrong passage. I mean, wrong practice. He's in fact not permitting that, or he's not affirming that, but he's actually talking about resurrection. He's making a point there, right? Um, and we study the context as well, right? Okay. Then, lastly. We interpret, um, uh, sorry, the last two things, right? Interpret the spirit of the passage, not necessarily the letter, right? So this is another uh, error that we can make when we look at it, when we look at scripture and we take it very literally when things are uh, mentioned in a symbolic manner, right? So, for example, I mean, this, of course, is very obvious. Uh, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 5, the Lord says, First, remove the plank from your own eye, then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So it doesn't mean that there is a you know, wooden frame which is in... Uh, it just means that, yeah, even the speck is, is not something that is there in the physical eye. You know, it's just referring to something that is hiding your vision, something that is causing a distortion of the way you see things because of your own, uh, you know, your own faults or your own 
sin or your own limitation. So is Lord is saying, you know, first remove that, then you will be able to see clearly. Okay, so so uh, we know that. So uh, I mean, this is a very extreme um, thing. Um, there are other places also where uh, when it when it says, you know, then the whole uh, I forget the references, but talks about multitudes, and we know that uh, or. Um, where John says, uh, what does it say? There's all the books in the Bible will not be able to contain, right? Uh, so he's using a hyperbole, hyperbole, or what, uh, what they call it, you know, to to refer to the fact that there were so many, like there were so many works, there's so many miracles, so many signs that the Lord Jesus did. So he's, it's like almost like, um, what would you say, an exaggeration, but to make a point, saying that. They were actually many, too many to be counted, right? So things like that. So um, we need to interpret in that way. Then lastly, interpret with our dependence on the Holy Spirit. Okay. So here again, you know, uh, the Lord says, when he, the spirit of truth has come, John 16 verse 13, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he, he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Okay. So uh, the Holy Spirit guides us into all that is the truth. Okay. So, so since He is the one who is guiding, we also see that He teaches and He also reminds us of the words of Jesus. So, um, so yeah. Um, um, okay, uh, I'm just seeing a uh, looking at a question by Jackin. If you see the chat, um, how do we correctly interpret, cast your bread upon the waters, and after many days it will bear fruit? Um, it is, is it Ecclesiastes? Can somebody help with the reference? We can look at that. Um, um, yes. What? I think it's in Ecclesiastes. Eleven, eleven, no, eleven, one. Okay. Uh, cast your bed upon the waters, for uh, you will find it after many years. Give a serving to seven, and also a date, for you do not know what evil um, be on earth. Um, so it's uh, the context. It's it's referring to uh, continuing to. Do the work, continuing to be generous, and uh, the fact that it will bear fruit. Yeah. So I, I know we don't use those. I mean, that's not our regular usage today. Cast your bread upon the waters. Um, but really, the the exact etymology of it, you know, what is that practice? I I'm not really sure, uh, Jackin. Uh, let's see. Anyone does it, anyone know? Cast your bread upon the waters. You know, throwing your chapati on the. On the river, on the yeah. Mm. Oh, I see. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So I will, uh, yeah. So here's a reference. So he's saying um, in Nile, in, in Egypt, is it? Yeah, okay. So in the river, that people will throw seeds. But here he's saying bread, which is actually a finished product, right? Not just the seed. So anyway, we'll come back to that, uh, Jackin. So thanks for that question. Uh, we'll look at that. Yeah, maybe we can check that out. And then we can, uh, you know, do, we can discuss it uh, in the next class, right? Ecclesiastes 11, 1, cast your bread upon the waters. Because it says, for you will find it after many days. Um, okay. Do good. Okay, so Prince is saying, do good without expecting gratitude or reward. <laughs> it's from Google. That's the meaning of Google. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Prince. So we shall... I shall get to the root of the matter. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
Okay, so so we have all these um, you know references. So when we say you know interpret with dependence on the Holy Spirit, um, so how do we do that? So one one good thing to say you know I depend on the Holy Spirit. Uh, so how do we practically do it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so seeking God, uh, prayerfully seeking Him, and uh, being in that fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But the whole process of receiving from Him. Uh, like how we've been learning about the gifts and all that, so we know that um, you know the, that God is holy and uh, His gifts are perfect, His word is perfect. But we as vessels, um, we have our own biases, we have our own prejudices, plus our own life experience. You know, we so we sometimes we can add that, right? So so how do we, yeah? Interpret, you know, when we look at the whole picture of okay, interpreting with dependence on the Holy Spirit. Okay, I think what you what you said is very well valid. So what Arun's saying is, you know, like his grandfather used to seek the Lord and say, okay, no education, no background of you know theological education. So completely depending on the Holy Spirit and saying, God, you, you teach. I'm completely dependent on you. So whatever download you get in your spirit from the Holy Spirit, you know, that's the thing. And I know of a person, I think I've shared also, like this person is completely, um, you know, uh, say like she's illiterate. She does not know how to read. Okay, So whatever scripture she quotes is what the Lord puts in her heart, like huge chunks of scripture she'll quote. And then she'll also give references. Everything is like what the Lord has put in her heart that morning or you know the previous days so that's uh, that's something you know like um yeah very completely dependent completely leaning on the holy spirit okay so how do we how do we so like okay maybe sri radha if you know you're preparing something and how do you <laughs> very helpful giving the mic there so how do you you know <laughs> how to depend on the holy spirit okay Let's say there's one passage. Okay, let's say Ecclesiastes 11, 1. Okay, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will not find it after many days. <laughs> uh, give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will. Tell me. So now you depend on the Holy Spirit, right? So how do we practically do it? You know, what do you think? Um, and not just Sri Radha, but anyone, anyone else also. But uh, first, first preference chance goes to Sri Radha. <laughs> After you have shared, anyone else? Um, what do you think uh, if you were to interpret this? Yeah, you can use the mic so others can hear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, prayerfully uh, seeking the Lord, do fasting. Mm. Nothing is coming. <laughs> no one like prayer. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, those are valid things, you know, really, you know, spiritual disciplines of fasting, prayer. Yes. Yes. Anyone else online, um, you know, folks also, please, you're part of it. Um, so, um, so we know that the word and the spirit agree. Okay, there's always, um, you know, God's word, God's will, God's ways, spirit of God. So it's not going to be pulling in different directions. So the Holy Spirit will lead us back to the Word. Um, so we know that, right? So, so even as we, um, you know, have this spiritual disciplines of fasting and prayer as a lifestyle, and not just when we, you know, encounter challenges, uh, when we have it as a lifestyle, then the Holy Spirit is. We are going to get into the habit of the Holy Spirit communi communicating to us, directing us. Like we read just now, I mean, the morning, you know, I, I will instruct, I will teach, I will guide. So that's a reality, present tense reality for us, privilege for us. So we get into that habit of fellowshipping, communing with the Holy Spirit, even as He leads us, speaks to us, right? So we understand 
uh, hear his voice. So he's going to lead us back to scripture. And as we make a, make it a lifestyle of studying scripture, going through scripture, one of the like uh, the uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to teach us and to remind us. So, uh, you know, even as we read through, He's going to give us that connection. Hey, you remember what you read then? He's going to bring quicken it to us and say, this is what it is. You know, this is going to be a step. This is going to be a line upon line upon line. So we know that, you know, um, there's a revelation that comes, right? So we read the word and then there is... Uh, and other things, you know, it's... God can lead others to speak into our lives, right? So you are, maybe you are uh, listening to someone, you know. So that is why we are the body of Christ, right? And that's why we have the fivefold ministry. That is why we have, you know. So even we are seeking and saying, God, I want to know the truth. You know, I'm really seeking. I And then I have this hunger. I have this desire, God. I want to know. And, uh, you know, Mark chapter 4 has a very interesting verse, right? After the parable of the sower, um, so the Lord says, you know, according to the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Meaning that you go with a big measure. Measure is, you know, like the vessel, you know, you go with a, you know, you go with a cup. Uh, this is all it's going to hold. So he's going to give you that, right? And this is the level of my hunger capacity. I'm saying I'm satisfied, you know, I'm just fill me with, fill me, I'm going to, I'll use this. But then you're saying, uh, I, I actually, you know, I, I've grown. I I don't need this, but I have something more, something bigger. You know, I'm just going with a bigger measure. You know, just fill this. Uh, I want this. So according to the measure that we use, it will be measured to us. It's talking about revelation, talking about what he wants to give us. So uh, it depends on our capacity also, you know, to receive. And uh, yeah, Jack and I see your... Um, comment uh, praying fervently trusting yeah, etc right so so the so that's it. so we we know that it's a progressive thing it's a lifestyle of uh, the lord illuminating the truth for us so he will teach us through people he will teach us through his uh, you know ministers and and so on so there is a confirmation um, of it so we interpret when we say interpret about dependence of the holy spirit it's a it's a wholesome thing you know what the Holy Spirit does on does with us personally, uh, even as we read, pray, revelation that will that others will confirm. But also, it it also means that you know him using the word, him using you know others to speak into our lives or confirming what he's already spoken to us. Yeah, things like that. But I, I remember, uh, uh, you know, this is the early days of marriage, and we were, we were just. I think a little before that is when this whole teaching of spirit, soul, and body, you know, it's something new. And everybody's teaching nowadays. <laughs> That's the first thing we start off, you know, when we learn about who we are in Christ and so on. But then those days, for me, it was like, wow, you know, why didn't anyone tell me, you know, that I've been struggling so, so much in my thought realm, imaginations, and all that. Uh, why didn't somebody tell me that, hey, I'm actually born again. I'm new on the inside, but this is my problem. Right, so uh, so so that was something. And then it it also doubt, right? Oh, uh, um, right. Okay, um, I'm from this background. I've never heard it before. What if it's something, you know, something uh, heretic? You know, all those doubts. And uh, we were in a meeting in the same, you know, church, CSI church. And here comes this person, and it's, you know, there's a special meeting and. And so praying for different people and very unusual, you know, like you don't see many such people in that such an environment, right? Um, um, in a very traditional conservative church environment. So this ministering and the prophetic and ministering, uh, you know, and a word of knowledge and all that. So he's come, he comes and prays over us and saying, you know, the Lord is teaching you. And whatever he's teaching you, he's confirming, you know, some of these new things that he's putting, he's teaching you. The Lord says he will teach you and he will confirm those things. Immediately there was a witness in my heart. And, oh wow! This is what you know. The Lord is confirming. The Lord is, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, reassuring that you're in the right direction. You know, go for it. Right. So, uh, so that's you know some, something. So the Lord can do that, right? Uh, when it comes to uh, affirming, reaffirming that you are on the right path, uh, and so on. Right. 
Okay. So um, Nina has a comment here. Um, sow seeds of goodness, even when it doesn't make sense to do so, only to reap a harvest. Um, Ecclesiastes 11, verse 1 to 6, but make it part of our life. Thank you, uh, Nina. Yeah. Yep. Okay, one question. Uh, yeah, well, go ahead. Uh, we could use the mic. Uh, For example, practically, when you are, uh, when you, you need to preach uh, and you need to prepare yourself for that, uh, are, were there any situations? First thing is, were there any situations where you um, haven't got that revelation or something that you're looking for? It's like, you know, you heard it from God and you preach it, it will be a different impact, or, um, you know, that you didn't get anything like that from God, but you have to go there on the stage and you have to preach it. Mm. Uh, like, uh, were there any scenarios like that? Mm. So your question is, okay, uh, does everything that you preach, is it a revelation, personal revelation that you got, <laughs> in other words, or do you just preach it uh, despite, you know, you're not having a personal, something like that? Sound ready. <laughs> <laughs> that in, in other words, that's what you're asking. Okay. Okay. So the thing is that, you know, there are certain things that you, you know, you go with faith. Right, in the sense, Lord, it's there in your word, and uh, and though God, you know, uh, you know, just uh, your prayer is always my prayer is always, Lord, make it real to me in some way or the other, make it real to me, highlight it to me, you know, uh, let that uh, touch me first, right? Um, so that is always my prayer. So, so the Lord does that. Uh, sometimes it's even before. Sometimes it, even as you're speaking, you realize, wow, you know, I, I'm just getting a new revelation. So it happens. Uh, right? Sometimes it's after. So, um, so not everything, you know, is something where God is, you know, connected and then made sense. Um, not everything is that way. But then you go because it's there in the Word. You go because it is, um, it is something that He is, you know, like as an example, this Psalm 32 verse 8 was something that I read. I know that it is the truth, but then it just came alive when today's uh, you know a whole incident, and it just made the connection. So I know it's, it becomes even more real to me, like even though it was a practical incident that happened. I know that every time there is a teaching and I think this this is one of the things that comes up in my mind. So yeah, there are instances like that, and also like the meaning of the whole thing, you know, the Lord giving a deeper meaning, etc. That is always there um, in some places. But you go with it because it is God's word. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay, I think we'll stop here, right? Um, thank you for being part of today's class. We'll continue next class. Thanks.